Well, good afternoon, folks. As you come in, we'd like to welcome you to our surprise soybean harvest field trip with uh, eighth grader Natalie Pratt from up in Lee County. Teachers, as you come in, if you want to take the poll, we'll give uh, we'll give all of our attendees a couple minutes to get in. So go ahead and take the poll, and we'll get started in just a couple of minutes. We're excited to bring Natalie Pratt and her mom, Katie Pratt, back. Uh, they launched our field trips this summer for teachers. So uh, I think you'll enjoy Natalie Pratt. She's an eighth grader, and she's going to tell us a little bit about herself. And uh, we'll, we'll get started here in just a couple of minutes. So teachers, take a minute and fill out the poll. See what you know about soybeans. I know it's this awkward wait time, folks. So we're gonna, <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. So we're letting people fill out the polls and thank you very much. We're now up to a couple more that have been admitted. Uh, we are recording this, uh, so it will uh, be available on our blog site, beyondthebardoor.wordpress.com here later. And we will go over the questions here in just a couple of minutes. We tend to let people have a minute or two to get in, but welcome to our surprise virtual field trip to the soybean harvest with Natalie Pratt. She's an eighth grader from Amboy, which is in Lee County, uh, North Central Illinois. And with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Several have filled out the poll and uh, I'll go ahead and uh, share the results. Um, first off, we'd like to welcome you. My name's Kevin Darty. I'm with the Illinois Agriculture in the Classroom Program. And we're here today with eighth grader Natalie Pratt and her mom, Katie Pratt. They're from Amboy up in Lee County and they are here to share with us a little bit about soybeans and soybean harvest. So uh, what I'm going to do is I should be sharing my screen and you should see um, you should see our, our questions uh, coming up. We'll go through those. And our first question was, soybean farmers measure yields in bushels per acre. A bushel is about the size of a laundry basket, or some of you might have seen a bushel basket, but uh, it's, and an acre is about the size of a football field. About how many soybeans per acre do we average? And the correct answer for that was C. 65 bushels per acre. That's a lot of soybeans. Our second question was about how many acres of soybeans are grown in Illinois each year? And the answer to that question is 10.7 million. 10.7 million, that's a lot of acres. 10 million football fields worth of soybeans. And finally, Soybeans are used in a wide variety of products every day. You probably don't realize it when you're eating soybeans. But how many soybeans does the average American eat in a single day? Well, about half a cup. Lots of ways that you use soybeans, including soybean oil, soy protein, and we're going to talk just a little bit about that. So, uh, thanks for playing along with the poll. We'll see what we uh, we'll see what we have there. And uh, I'm we're really excited to bring in uh, Natalie. Pratt. And Natalie is a favorite of ours. She's from Amboy. And Natalie, why don't you tell us a little bit about your family and a little bit of background about you. So I'm Natalie Pratt. I'm an eighth grader at the Amboy Junior High School. Um, I live on a farm called Grand Prairie Farms. I have been since I was born and I doubt I will ever get out of it. <laughs> so um, on Grand Prairie Farms, we farm um, corn and soybeans and seed corn with um, our family, the Pratt's, and with my dad, mom and dad, so my grandma and grandpa on my dad's side. And we've been doing that for, well, they've been farming for their entire They've life. been mostly farming for their entire life. So Grand Prairie Farms has been around for a little while. And Lee County is, uh, Lee County is in North Central Illinois. So if you look at the middle of the state, uh, 
39 goes uh, from, from basically uh, uh, Rockford, which is the top in the center of the state, down to Bloomington, Illinois. Uh, Lee County is uh, toward the top of that. You're closer to the Rockford area than you are to Bloomington, so north central Illinois. And Natalie, in addition to, um, in addition to farming with her family, her mom's side of the family is also from Lee County, but in a different part of the state, a different part of the county. But you've got farming in your blood. And uh, you kind of brushed over this, you and your brother and your mom and your dad and your grandparents. Uh, but uh, tell us about your brother, your older brother, and how active he's involved in the farm. So I have an older brother, Ethan Pratt. He's a sophomore at Amboy High School, and he is um, a farmer. He is still pretty young, but I mean, he's a sophomore, and that's all he does is farm. He's a um, lot different than I am. <laughs> uh, Ethan is very much so a farmer, so uh, it's uh, it's not that he's just helping out. He is doing stuff uh, that every farmer across the state of Illinois is doing now, and he's kind of in his heyday because harvest, this is the fun part. This is the part where you see what happened with it, and I think you'll see that with Natalie's video. So uh, earlier in the week, Natalie, uh, she worked on recording a video for us of soybean harvest, so we're going to play that video first. So folks, if you direct your attention to the screen, we're going to, we're going to showcase Natalie's, we're going to showcase Natalie's uh, video, uh, Welcome to Soybean Harvest at Grand Prairie Farm. Looking at how we harvest soybeans. Let's take a look. Unlike corn, where there's many varieties, sweet corn, popcorn, Indian corn, with soybeans, there's only one, the soybeans. You may be wondering why all these soybeans look dead. Well, that's actually the color that soybeans need to be when starting the harvesting process. That's a lot of soybeans out there. In fact, did you know that one acre of soybeans can produce 82,308 crayons? That's a lot of crayons. And a lot of soybeans. One acre is about the size of a football field. So, it would be pretty hard to harvest all of these acres of soybeans by hand. Good thing we have machinery. This is one of the biggest staples of farming almost anywhere in the world, a combine. a bit more complicated than that. This is the sickle. The sickle is what cuts the bean plants from the ground. Then the reel spins around holding the fingers, which then pushes the bean plant from the ground into the draper, which is also known as a conveyor belt, which then pushes all the bean plants into the middle conveyor belt to be pushed into the back of the combine into the big bed. Soybean plants are very interesting plants in the fact that they grow soybean pods all the way down to the bottom of the plant. The head of the combine skims the ground to make sure that we don't miss a single bean pod. Combine gets full, 
the auger attached to the combine swings out and flashing lights go off, letting the auger cart driver know that it's time for the combine to be emptied. After the auger is lined up with the cart, the combine driver can start filling the beans into the auger way. After the auger cart is full, it will then drive up to one of the waiting trucks to fill it with beans. After the truck is full, it will then drive away to take the beans to an elevator to be stored until needed. With updated technology and machinery, a field of soybeans can go from this to this in less than a day. And trust me, we've got a lot more days to go. Well, that was Soybean Harvest on Grand Prairie Farm. Well, thank you, Natalie, for a great uh, video. Uh, we're going to stop this one too, and I'll stop sharing. Um, as Natalie shared, as Natalie shared throughout the uh, throughout the program, um, their farm their farm does a couple of things. She actually mentioned they're currently harvesting soybeans, but at the very beginning of the video, you talked about corn, and your family also works with corn. Now let's talk about what your family does specifically with the seed corn and the field corn. Um, you're, you're involved in that. And can you explain to our folks what the difference between seed corn and field corn is? So um, seed corn is, <clears throat> excuse me, seed corn is the corn that we grow that will then be turned into seed for next year's crop. So um, in a field of seed corn, there is, <clears throat> Excuse me. The cob, we will take the seeds off the cob, but instead of sending the seeds off the cob to a plant to be put into corn oil or cornstarch, they will be put into um, big containers to be shipped off to plants that will then make that corn, the corn seed, into corn seed for farmers next year. So we are essentially making a roundabout business of we are growing the corn and then we are taking the corn seeds and the product from the corn to be put into next year's product to just keep making and making. Exactly, that was a phenomenal explanation. But uh, personally, that, that becomes more of the farm side. But uh, I do know that Natalie, you're also kind of invested in the two other types of corn that you mentioned, both Indian corn and popcorn. You wanna tell us a little bit about your popcorn and Indian corn activities? So I have a business called Bubba Bug Popcorn um, with my brother. And we grow about an acre of popcorn each year, and we do it all by hand. We plant it by hand, we harvest it by hand, we package and ship it by hand. Um, and we've been doing that for about eight years now. So we do that with the popcorn side. And then for Indian corn, um, my mom has big gardens. She has a lot of gardens and a lot of flowers and a lot of Indian corn. So we have a lot of gardening and flowers and Indian corn and broom corn on our farm. We have a little bit of everything. And what do you do with that Indian corn besides decorate with it? So Indian corn can be used for decorations. Mm -hmm. and what well, but what I was getting at, don't you sell it? Don't you have an event coming up with a club that you're involved in? Oh, um, I'm part of the 4-H club, um, our local 4-H club, the Young Seekers. And we are selling, um, pump, we're doing a pumpkin sale as our yearly fundraiser. So we're selling pumpkins and broom corn and Indian corn and some gourds and amboy. So we're doing that. So uh, part of the fall festival type thing or activities, people can get their, uh, you guys have all grown it. So it's there and other members have done that. And that leads me back to one of the things I was impressed by was the t-shirt you were wearing. It's a different one today. I should have asked uh, if you'd wear the same shirt again, but can you tell me a little bit about the t-shirt you, uh, you were wearing in the video 
I know it said uh, hard work, blue ribbons. Uh, it was it was along that theme about your county fair. So tell us a little bit about your t-shirt. So um, I won that t-shirt from a Compere financial contest that I did because I am very involved in public speaking. Um, I do it for 4-H every year. Um, I've gone to state every year for my 4-H contest. I love acting and musicals. I'm in all of my school theater and speech teams. And I entered a Compere financial contest about um, a 4-H project and what 4-H really means to you and what your projects do for your overall um, like what they mean for your life. And I did public speaking because it's a big part because my mom was, as we call it in our family, she's a professional public speaker. That's what she does. And I think it's cool that public speaking is now such a big part of my life, whether it's on stage at a theater or doing a speech about women's rights for 4-H. So yeah, that's a great that's a great segment to to to, to segue into this. Folks that uh, that are joining us, if you do have questions, please use the chat feature or the question and answer section, and we will certainly get to those. We'd welcome your questions to to we work with Natalie about. But uh, kind of a little bit of background. Even though some things are different for you at school, and we talked about the different social distancing and what's going on in your your school with band and chorus, uh, the farm still happens. Uh, things are still happening on the farm, um, and uh, uh, the the the, uh, the pandemic hasn't stopped what's happened there. But uh, you know, those farmers, as they've been working the last couple of weeks in those combines and in those in those trucks and trailers, there's a lot of support uh, behind the scenes too. What's one thing you and your mom are doing uh, as we speak, and she might be leaving here in another minute? What's one of the big important things you have to do uh, every day? Almost every night, me and my mom make a little restaurant in our kitchen to make dinner for about six or seven people, um, for everybody working on our farm, our family members, and some hired help. So we have to make dinner and package it all up with silverware and drinks, and then we start driving out to find people and give them some dinner for the night. So it's not just, it's not just, uh, it's not just people in the field, it's all the extras. You know, you were sitting in the uh, combine in the middle of your in the middle of your uh, presentation, and in the presentation you talked about uh, an earlier presentation. You talked about uh, some of the benefits and things that were going on in the uh, in the uh, things that were going on in the combine. Uh, one of the things that people might not know is uh, some of the new technology that's available in combines. Can you talk a little bit about that, including the buddy seat and maybe even the GPS and some of the things you know? So um, I don't know a lot about technology in our tractors, but I do know a little bit. So um, there's a GPS on it and a field tracker thing. So uh, <laughs> when you go into the field with a combine or with a planter, mostly for those two, it will line you up using radars. I'm sorry, I stole it. Look, it's, GPS. It's, GPS. Satellite. it's satellite technology to line you up straight so that when you look into a field down a row when you're driving by, your row is straight and you can see directly through it into the middle of the field. Because I think that without that kind of technology, you might look down a row and it would look a little swervy. Right, and it depends on who's driving, exactly. So we do have a couple of questions coming in, but one of, the, one of my favorite parts of an earlier video you did for us was uh, something that was underneath the, uh, the buddy seats where the buddy sits, but what's another thing that those farmers have access to and newer equipment? How about the refrigerator? Newer equipment has a refrigerator underneath the buddy seat, which the buddy seat is my favorite seat in the tractor, but there's a little cooler down there because John Deere knows that when you're in the tractor, you're in there for a little while. And for our folks that are not from a farm, there typically is some competition between John Deere, which is green, and Case IH, which is red. So we got a couple of questions coming in, and let's get to those. First off, how about animals on your farm? Do you have any animals on your farm? Or yeah. what about any family members that have animals? Um, I have, we have some, a dog, Coco. Um, she's 14, chocolate lab. And I, for more farm animals, I have two cows. Um, they're twins, Rosie and Rex. And actually, they will be going to the butcher in a couple weeks. Can I say that? Yeah, yeah you can yeah. say that. That happens. That's be, part of I it. Yep. We raise cattle true. for me. Yep. Yep. So they will be going away in a couple weeks. They're not, since um, a cool fact, since the cows are twins, 
they actually can't, the girl cow, the cow of the two, can't go into pasture to become a mom because of just the fertility of being twins. So no matter a girl or a boy, if you have twins and you raise them, you cannot put them back into the pasture to become, to keep breeding. To keep breeding, that's a great, that's a great comment. And for the questioner, um, just happens to be where Grand Prairie Farm is located in Lee County. It is very well situated for raising, uh, raising crops. It's great land just for raising crops. Sometimes if we have less fertile land, less, uh, less you, saw, you saw good, great plains there. You saw the nice level fields, that kind of stuff. If you have rocks or hills or not necessarily desirable land, sometimes that's where you'll see animals. That's where you'll see animals. And then the other half of Lee County, um, less, less desirable land to, to some extent. So you see more livestock production there. That was a great question that came in for us. Uh, we've got another question here about how long does it take to, uh, to harvest a field? And uh, how, how, I think the question for, for, our, for our audience is really depends on how big the field is, first off. And, and uh, um, I, I'm, I'm gonna direct this more to Katie um, and to, to the mom here. How have you seen how technology and how things have, have uh, improved over time, how quickly we can get a, a, a harvest in? Yeah, it's pretty amazing. My husband and I consider ourselves young farmers, still a little bit. And just in the time that we've been married, um, the amount of technology that's come available to farmers is pretty crazy. So, you know, how, how long does it take? It depends on the field size, of course. It also depends on the equipment size and who's in the field. So if you have one farmer working just by his or herself, then that labor, you know, has to be spread out from driving the combine, filling the wagons, headed to the grain elevator to dump the beans, et cetera, et cetera. Versus if you have a farm crew of four or five people that can run all of that equipment, you can knock out a couple thousand acres in a day. And, you know, back in the day when we, well, not me, but my grandparents, my great grandparents worked by hand you know, the goal was to get an acre done or a couple acres done. And now we talk about thousands of acres, thousands of football fields. So it's uh, pretty amazing. And what's even more amazing too is just the diversity that you'll see across the farms in Illinois and across the Midwest and how people work and the, the farm structure they have in place during harvest. It usually all reverts back to a good family structure that shows up, gets the work done. Shows up and gets the work done. And additionally, some of you, uh, even as uh, children, you guys might have played with toys where you got your tractor and your wagon. We didn't see a lot of wagons in the video you saw. And one of the reasons there was instead of the wagon, now you see the big auger carts and you see the big semis because technology has become we're growing more on less land, we're harvesting more, we're putting more in. So everything has continued to get bigger. Everything's continued to get bigger. Uh, you know, back the uh, 30, 40 years ago, it wasn't uncommon to have an eight row uh, uh, combine, an eight row head. How big is the corn combine you guys have? 24. So again, three times the size going through the field, three times as quick. Another question that came in personally here was, those were really funny tractor tires on that combine. Tell them a little bit about the tractor tires if you looked at that. So you might have saw that driving the auger cart was a track tractor. So, <clears throat> sorry, tracks on tractors actually make it a lot easier to drive. So if it's muddy out, track tractors get tracked tractors um, instead of wheels give more traction so that they will won't get stuck as easy because you could probably tell how hard it would be to pull that thing out with the truck. So they won't get stuck as easy. It also Tractors are really heavy, as you could probably tell. Um, so having tracks really spreads the weight of the tractor out so that when a tractor drives across a piece of land, it doesn't start, it doesn't compact the soil as much. It doesn't flatten out the land more as driving with tires would. That's great. We've got a couple crop questions here. One of them is from Mrs. Zubalt's class. Uh, they're down in Effingham County in Altamont, Illinois. Um, and uh, she asks, her class wants to know, do you raise any wheat, any wheat in your area? Um, so Grand Prairie Farms doesn't, but my mom's dad, my papa does. 
he has um, a lot a lot of cows. He grazes cattle, corn, soybeans, and wheat for his cows. So he does harvest wheat, but we on Grand Prairie Farms don't. Right. So, uh, and a great question for those folks down there. They're down south of 70 in the southern half of the state. Most of the wheat in Illinois is grown down your way. Uh, we do see a byproduct for folks that don't know. A byproduct of wheat would be the uh, uh, the, the straw, the, the, the part that holds the wheat head at the top. Folks especially could use that and you guys might actually sell some of that with your pumpkins and gourds. People like to decorate for the fall with straw bales, but that also serves as bedding for cattle and for others throughout the thing. Great question from Altamont. Got another question about, I've got another question here about the different types of corn. And it's it's from a, a group of students. How are the, how, how can you tell what, do they look different? You talked about popcorn, sweet corn, field corn. There's even sweet corn. But does it look different or how do you know? So you can tell by a lot of things. Farmers usually tell just because farmers have this cool sense. They can just tell it. But we actually have some different corns here. So this is Indian corn. You can probably tell it's color different. Um, it's probably used for decoration around your house right about now. So this is Indian corn. This is field corn. So, sorry. so this is field corn. It probably looks just like you would think corn would. So field corn is the kind of corn that's used for um, feed for animals. And this is the kind of corn, and this is the kind of corn that goes into like corn starch, corn, corn oil, crayons. It go, this is the kind of corn that you could find in your nutrition label. And then the last type of corn that I mentioned was popcorn. So this is a type of our popcorn that we grow on Baba Bug. But um, you can kind of tell the difference. So between the popcorn and the field corn, the indents, um, these kernels are more pointed and oval shaped, and these kernels are more square shaped. And I don't know if you can tell, but there's little indents in the kernel. And that's what happens when it dries out. So when your corn starts to get indent, that's when you know that it's time to harvest your field corn. Right. And uh, not only that, but also in the throughout the year, they grow different sizes. Uh, sweet corn, sometimes you'll see sweet corn as you're driving down a road next to field corn and it looks stunted or immature. That's just how tall it grows. Folks, these are all different breeds and different types. So think dogs. Sometimes you got Great Danes or Mastiffs, and sometimes you have little Beagles, medium-sized ones, sometimes you have little Dachshunds. So it's all bred differently, same root genes and where it came from, but different content that goes into it. Another really, really good question. Um, with soybeans, there's only one type of soybean, and I think you, I think you actually might have some soybeans there. We'll, we'll, we'll sh give you a chance to show those. Just, uh, you did a great job in the video, but they went out and found some soybeans for you folks, so. Um, I'll let you so, get your props together. <laughs> We've got two kinds of soybeans here. So I'll start with, start with these. Well, yeah. So these, they're not really different types, but these are called cheater beans. <laughs> yeah, you're right. So we call those cheater beans. That's kind of lingo on the farm. Nana will tell you why. Yeah, so cheater beans are planted after um, a field of corn. Oh, of wheat, sorry. So after a field of wheat is harvested on a farm, um, they could take advantage of the land that's already been cultivated and fertilized by planting um, beans. So these are just called, they're either called cheater beans or short season beans because um, they will be the last thing to be harvested on the farm. So we will harvest everything and then we will come back to harvesting these soybeans just um, because farmers are just that awesome that they just don't stop until um, it's snowing. So that's why we have beans. You might see beans that look brown or green. And As for Mrs. Zumwalt's class down in Southern Illinois, uh, you we, we also cheater beans, but also second crop. After the wheat is planted and harvested, you can bring in a second crop and uh, you know, it, it's, it's you know, like doing extra credit if you're in school. So that's just extra work and getting ahead for next year. But you've got a plant there that looks like it, uh, it's ready for harvest. Yeah, so this one, um, people that know it would might say it's ready for harvest, but other people might call it, it looks dead because um, 
it does look a little dead, but that this is actually just the color that soybean plants have to be when starting the harvesting process because it needs to be dried out. The moisture level needs to be down because if we were to harvest um, a crop of soybeans that looks like the beans that I showed up, the green ones, if we were to harvest beans <laughs> right now like this, um, they would go in the truck and they would mold because the moisture level is so high. But when beans look dead like this, it's because the moisture level is down, they've turned brown, the leaves have fallen off. And that means that if you were to take a little bean pod off your plant and pop it open, and pop it open, you would get soybeans. And all, um, like about a couple of these would equal one of these. So a lot of soybeans. Lots and lots of soybeans. That's a great question. Uh, a question here, and I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Katie answer this one. But it's a it's a it's a, it's an ag literacy question. Not nothing against Natalie, but uh, it's a question that I want to have answered. It talks about: Do you eat any of the crops you grow, or are they all sold to big companies? And Katie, I want to talk a little bit about the supply chain in this. So it's kind of a curveball question, Natalie. Not nothing against you, but your mom and I we do this kind of stuff. So a little curveball question here. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So we do eat what we grow, but we just don't go out to the field and pluck it, pluck it off the plant and then bring it in the house and eat it. Um, what, what we grow are field corn and the soybeans. It's the byproducts of this is what we find in our food products. So starch, sugar, and oil is what you get out of corn. So whenever you see corn oil or corn starch or corn syrup on the ingredients label, that's coming from this. And then um, your soybeans, very similar. Um, check your label on a bottle of vegetable oil and it will say soybean oil. That's the ingredient in vegetable oil is soybean oil. But uh, some farmers grow uh, food grade soybeans that can be used in tofu. Um, you know, there's dried bean pods that you can eat as well. Edamame would be something. So certainly there's that. Uh, for us, our market for our soybeans is all export. So the majority of our beans goes on barges down the Mississippi River and then gets on big ships and heads to Asia to be used for food for pigs. So that's where our soybeans go. Um, and then our, our corn crop is disseminated. We're so fortunate where we're at that we have a lot of market access. So there's a processing plant over the river in Clinton, Iowa, that will break this down into those byproducts that start sugar and oil. Um, we have several ethanol plants in our area that we can sell to as well. So this corn could be fuel as well. Um, and then of course feed, so feed for animals. So there's lots of different uses for these crops. Um, and, and yes, it, it will eventually circle back to us, but our fields aren't like my garden that I go out and I pick a salad and bring it in to eat for the day. And the Pratts do have a monstrous garden too. You'll see lots of Facebook posts and blog posts. And if you're in the Dixon Amboy area, there's probably a basket out at the side of the porch that anybody can come and take the extras of. So really, really good question for teachers, maybe an extra credit thing here, but uh, tomorrow Saturday, as you get up, every time you go to the, uh, you grab something to eat, whether you're starting with your cornflakes in the morning or you grab a Coke in the afternoon, check the byproducts and check the label list and you'll be surprised to see how many soybeans and how much corn you're eating on a daily basis. So if you guys uh, out there want to watch and send us a, a copy of a link to that we'd be happy to post that but that's it that's with that we do have one last question that's a really good question I want to make sure that we address for uh, Natalie um, how old were you when you started 4-H her students this this teacher students are in fourth grade are they too young um nobody's way too young to join 4-H I started being a clover bud which you do two years oh yeah like two years a year and a half of clover bud before you go into being um, a 4-H member. So I started Clover Buds when I was five and I have been in actual for in an actual 4-H for like six years, I think, six, five years. And it's been really fun. So, so 
if you want more information about 4-H or other groups, that's, that's all run through the University of Illinois Extension. So look in your phone book. I don't even know if they make phone books anymore, sorry. But look online, Google online your county name and extension. So Lee County Extension, and it'll tell you, and they would be happy, there's going to be a web page that pops up, and they would be happy to share with you about that. Uh, we're running close on time, but on our website, on the blog site as well, we've got the link to our Soybean Ag Mag, where more stuff is out there. I want to throw a couple of great books out there for our teachers. If you don't know about Henry Ford, Full of Beans, Henry Ford Builds a Car by Peggy Thomas. Oh, I think they have it too. See, it's a really good book. Uh, another one, an Illinois book, Auntie Yang's Great Soybean Picnic by an Illinois author that talks about edamame. Those are the edible soybeans. Um, they kind of look like lima beans. You might see those in uh, Asian markets or something like that. And of course, Popcorn Country by Chris Peterson talking about popcorn. And like Natalie said, she grows Bubba Bug popcorn. With that, folks, we went over just a couple of minutes, but we always have plenty to talk about. When Natalie Pratt from Lee County and her mom, Katie Pratt, join us, guys, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to post all of this on our blog site, beyondthebarndoor.wordpress.com. You'll have access to uh, uh, the books, the book titles, and some other videos. I know school's about out. In your big yellow buses, they're probably powered by soybean oil, soy biodiesel. And if you're not in the bus line, you're in the car pickup line, you're going to get a chance to uh, have your, your car fueled by ethanol, which is made from corn, or E85. With that, folks, Natalie, Katie, thank you so much for joining us. Everyone, have a great day. We really appreciate all your help. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you.